little bit more about um, what kind of genetic testing is available to find out if women are at risk for, for breast cancer? Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, the first thing that we look at in terms of if someone's at risk for breast cancer is the history. And most importantly, particularly when we're thinking about a gene mutation, we look at the family history. And gene mutations are um, a genetic abnormality that's passed on um, from a mother to her child, and uh, it increases your risk of breast cancer dramatically. So what we look for initially is um, how many people in the family have cancer. Typically, cancers would be in multiple generations, so grandmother, mother, aunt, daughter. Um, there are tendencies for it occurring at younger ages, so women tend to be premenopausal and even very young in their you know 30s. Um, in addition, we look for the associated cancers, which in the case of the breast cancer gene is ovarian cancer. So if we see a family history that has mother, aunt, sister, and perhaps an aunt with ovarian cancer, that particularly raises our interest because that sounds like this could be genetic. So when a patient has a family history that sounds worrisome for genetic mutation, then we generally refer patients for genetic counseling. So genetic counseling is really important because what they do is a formal assessment and they take a proper pedigree of the entire family and the lineage and they document all the different cancers. And if your history is suspicious enough, then at that point in time, the counselors will advise you on whether or not you'd be eligible to have a blood test to see if, you're, you're, if you carry the gene mutation. Okay. Um, we generally recommend that people have a genetic counseling appointment first to determine if their pedigree or their family history is suspicious for a mutation. Once um, it is determined that there you are suspicious for mutation, then a decision needs to be made as to whether or not you want to have the test. Because knowing that you have the mutation obviously has some implications. Um, so in Calgary, uh, the main tests, uh, the most common tests that we test for are BRCA1 and BRCA2, which are the genes for breast cancer um, and ovarian cancer. There are a couple other rare um, gene mutations um, that are associated with syndromes like lee fraumeni syndrome and Cowden syndrome, but these are much less common. So how? I mean, how common is it for women to have this gene mutation, the BRCA1 and 2? Yeah. So it's actually not that common. Um, of all people with breast cancer, hereditary or mutation-associated breast cancers account for less than 5%. So most women don't have a gene mutation that's causing them to be at risk for breast cancer. We do know there are certain populations that are at higher risk for breast cancer mutations, such as Ashkenazi Jewish women. Um, we have purported or reported higher rates um, of the mutation within that um, heritage. Um, so that uh, is something that always raises our interest as well to see if they have any uh, Jewish ancestry. For women that test positive, mm -hmm. um, what should they do to prevent cancer? Should they get a double mastectomy? Yeah, so I mean, the knowledge of, of the increased risk, and it's not insignificant, so um, there's a reported range of the risk associated with the gene mutation, and most BRCA carriers, there's the two types, BRCA1 and 2, there's a range between 50 and up to 70% risk of breast cancer um, up to age 70, so that's pretty high. Uh, generally speaking, when we talk about the options for women with the gene, there's three. The first one would be um, what we call surveillance or high-risk surveillance. And the idea there is to try and pick up any tumors at a very early stage um, where we could treat it and hopefully you know, take care of it before it becomes something that's more serious. Um, right now, the recommendations for screening in women who have BRCA1 and 2 mutations is for MRI, beginning at the ages 25 to 30 um, on an annual basis, as well as mammogram. Okay? So that's high-risk surveillance, um, along with obviously the clinical breast examination by the physician. Um, the second option would be prophylactic uh, risk-reducing surgery. So the idea there is that if we remove the breast tissue at risk, then there'll be a lower chance that they'll get a breast cancer. So you're really preventing a breast cancer from occurring. Um, it's not a perfect strategy. Uh, risk-reducing surgery reduces the risk by about 90 to 95% probably because we can't remove every last cell um, and uh, the case reports and series we have suggest that the reduction is quite good but it's not perfect. The final option is something called chemo prevention or taking a medication to try and prevent uh, again an occurrence of a breast cancer. Um, the most common one that is known is something called tamoxifen. It's an anti-hormonal medication that women can take to prevent breast cancer. It's not used uh, specifically for women with BRCA. There's been a number of studies showing that women who are just at generalized high risk can take this medication. Um, uh, the studies in BRCA mutation carriers um, aren't really great. Um, and women who are BRCA1 um, tend to have tumors that don't respond to hormones. So the efficacy or the ability for that drug to work in BRCA1 carriers is less 
um, is less known, um, although it is, it is an option. So those are the three main options would be high risk surveillance, risk reducing surgery, or chemo prevention. Um, and that's really what the women, once they've had their genetic counseling and they've had their testing and are given a result, we do discuss those options and the genetic counselors do do that. As a surgeon, I see a lot of women obviously who are interested in having the bilateral prophylactic mastectomies and because we have enough time, we can often offer them immediate reconstruction um, at the same time. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, um, does that happen often? Do you, do you see a lot of patients that, that do this every year? Yeah. So. Um, the patients that I see, it's a little bit of a biased cohort. I am a surgeon, and they usually come to me because they are considering having bilateral prophylactic mastectomies. Um, I, I would say, if you look at the literature, the number of women who actually go ahead with the, the mastectomies is, is not uh, its not 100% for sure. Many women opt to go ahead with the screening. Um, I think a lot of it depends on the patient's experience. I've had patients, and this is a, my common, this is completely anecdotal, my experience, is that women who've lived through a loved one having a di cancer diagnosis, they have seen what it's like and they don't want to go through it. And to me, that seems to be a big driver of them wanting to have the surgery. Um, so the women that I see, most of them are, are very much interested in it, and I'd say probably 75% of the ones that I see go ahead with it. Um, and it's a combination of myself and the, the geneticists as well as um, the plastic surgeon to talk about you know, what type of mastectomy and what type of, re type of reconstruction would be best for that individual. Um, so the other thing that we are, are obviously concerned about with BRCA1 and 2 is the risk of ovarian cancer. Um, the risk of ovarian cancer is in the range of 20 to 40 percent in the two different types of gene mutations. And um, most often we, the genetic counselors will help arrange a consultation with a gynecologist um, to talk about uh, options for uh, risk reduction there. The main option there is um, for uh, removal of the ovaries. Um, and um, that's something that is often discussed as well. Uh, the indications for screening, unlike breast, where we can do mammograms and ultrasounds and, and MRIs, ovarian cancer is much harder to screen for. Um, and it's a bit controversial as to whether or not women should be having pelvic ultrasounds and blood tests. Um, so again, that's recommended that those women have a consultation with a gynecologist to talk about um, what strategy is best for her. Why is it controversial that women should be having pelvic ultrasounds? Well, it's, um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a gynecologist, so um, in, in terms of the evidence as to whether or not it helps, okay, so usually when we screen people, we hope to catch things at a state where we can uh, influence the outcome, i.e. if we catch it earlier, then hopefully the patients will live longer. Um, and in the case of ovarian screening, I, I think it's a little bit controversial as to whether or not it actually achieves that goal, and yet it puts women through the test every year, um, and there's the possibility of finding things that are not significant, et cetera. Right, because mm -hmm. I mean, but will uh, will it actually show up if there is cancer? If if you get a pelvic ultrasound? Well, that's the thing. It's not I'm a not perfect sure. test. I'm yeah. Sure. So okay. you know, um, it's very mixed. Some guidelines recommend that people do have annual uh, ultrasounds of the ovaries, um, as well as a, as well as a blood test. And other recommendations are that the evidence is up in the air and it's controversial. So overall, I think the recommendation would be to have a discussion with a gynecologist about removing the ovaries um, versus surveillance. And I think that in general, there's been a, a support for removal of the ovaries after the childbearing is complete um, because ovarian cancer is so hard to screen for. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's usually detected um, at a later stage. Okay.